Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media, where we address the problems of a modern world. So stay tuned. We have an awesome show for you today. We're going to delve back into the spirit world, where we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities in high places. The Nephilim exorcist casting out demons. Now, this is how you study your Bible. Come on. Topics covered, the sons of the fallen ones, the disembodied Nephilim, King David the Exorcist, and Christ the Giant Slayer. Welcome to our channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. But most of all, enjoy the show. Hope you learned something. Psalms 22, verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying... He trusted on Yahuwah that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. The Sons of the Fallen Ones. So we're going to delve into the spirit world again, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, why Messiah focused so much on casting out evil spirits. It was like uh, everywhere he went, he did that. And as a miracle, as as we should know, miracles are what I call attention getters, right? They are mainly there to, you have to get the, grab the people's attention, right? Um, so he's doing a good work, of course, by, you know, removing demons from people, but there's more to it than that. He's, he's doing it so that people understand something about him. Okay, so you can read the Old Testament, and for the most part, you don't see people, you know, demons being cast out of people, you know. But in the New Testament, at the time of uh, Messiah, uh, there's a lot of that going on. So, you know, why the change? What's the difference? So we read here in Genesis 6 and uh, verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply, on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Which, of course, is one of the reasons the Apostle Paul says that women should have their heads covered while they pray, because basically they're are angels uh, watching uh, and lusting after them, so you need to uh, cover your head so that uh, you don't entice them. And so, we, you know, when the Messiah talks about uh, the last days being like the days of Noah, what you really need to do is look at what was going on in the, in the days of Noah. And we tend to not really look at it hard. You know, we, we take it for granted. But look at what was going on in the days of Noah. There were these sons of God procreating with human women, producing monstrous Nephilim, right? So there's going to come a time again where this kind of thing is going to go on again. Maybe a little differently, but once you understand what was going on and that who was ruling the earth and who was being exterminated and who, and, and you know, just let's get into it. I mean, we've been through this in other videos, but I'm trying to drive this point home before we continue. So uh, Genesis 6, chapter 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them as wives of all which they chose. So... If you're wondering how angels can procreate with human women, well, it's very simple. You know, uh, many times in the Old Testament, you'll see angels manifesting as men, so they have that ability. Uh, unfortunately, if an angel manifests as a man, then he's now subject to the lusts and temptations of the flesh, because he's now in the flesh, and sure enough, you know. And there's more to it than that. The angels were jealous of man because man is created in the image of the Most High, and he's able to procreate and create families. 
So the angels decide they want families. They want to be in the image of the Most High. But that's not what they were created to do. They are ministering spirits. And they're supposed to be ministering to human beings. And some of them don't like that thought. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. Now that word, this is the King James Version. So that word giants is misleading. It's Nephilim, right? Um, and I believe the word Nephilim means... Oh, I, you know, somebody just told me that. I, <laughs> I forgot what it was. It was a comment, uh, and they said, no, this is what it means. But uh, it's definitely not, giants is not a great word for it because it's misleading, because you would assume that in order for something or someone to be a Nephilim, he has to be a giant, which is probably part of the plan to get you to, to believe that, oh, they're all gone because there's no more giants. But is that true? Do you have to be a giant? I say no, and there's a reason I say no. And in, uh, in my previous video, um, or previous couple videos, we talked about it that uh, in the book of Daniel, it says that uh, uh, they, in the last days, the reason the feet of the statue of Daniel, it says it's iron mixed with my, miry clay, and in that, in that, uh, in those verses, it talks about, and they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And so that's a genetic thing. And so what I'm saying to you is, at this point, if you notice, uh, Goliath, who was a descendant of Nephilim, he was a giant, but he wasn't a kaiju. You know what a kaiju is? You know, it's the Japanese monster series, right? It's like Godzilla. No, they're not like Godzilla anymore. They're, they're just really large men because they're diluted. The, 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 the gene, the Nephilim gene is diluted now, mostly human, right? But by the time you get to the feet, the last days, the feet of the statue of Daniel, iron mixed with miry clay, and they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, which means at this point they have so much human DNA you cannot tell them apart from you. You cannot distinguish between a human and a Nephilim descendant or a Rephaim, the terrors, right? But you can't distinguish. They have infiltrated humanity. And remember what they did in the beginning? They, they essentially started to replace human beings on the face of the earth. And they started to, uh, to deplete the, the natural resources on the planet and to destroy the earth because that's what they are. They are, they are designed and built for destruction and we'll see that uh, shortly. We also talked about it in the previous videos. Um, the sons of God descend. You, I, I think you should uh, watch that video. Um, and my enemies defeated. You should watch that video. In fact, it's a whole playlist. So um, how to study your Bible and also uh, God by uh, any other name. That's another good playlist. And the Jubilee series playlist. You, sh you should watch those because in that it starts telling you more about the spirit or realm. So I, I say that, say all that to say this. Um, yeah, we, fl we fight not against flesh and blood and there's a lot going on that we can't see with our eyes. Don't assume you know it all. I look at how we're depleting the resources, how we're destroying the earth. And you can't do this stuff by accident. There are people in powerful places. They've climbed to the top and now control this world system. And these people, literally, their mandate is to destroy, right? And their mandate is to replace human beings as the dominant species on this planet. I know that sounds wild, but until you understand that, until you believe that, you're you're going to lose, you know, what I'm saying. But the Most High is not going to uh, allow that to happen. So some will stay wide awake on this. And at some point, the Most High intervenes. And, you know, they talk about the two witnesses being given power, uh, whether it's two men or the rejoining of Judah and Israel. And they are the two witnesses. That's something to think about. And I tend to lean more that way. Not just two men. I mean, it might manifest itself as two men, 
but I believe they'll be one of the tribe of Yahuda and the other of the tribe of Ephraim or Joseph. And they've, they've been fully awakened and empowered. And usually the Most High sends miracles when? When, when it becomes impossible. Does that make sense? When, when you're outmanned, outgunned, outwitted, I mean, you, because he does these things, why? To show that it was him who did it. He chooses the weak and the base things to confound the mighty. So anyway, Genesis 6, chapter 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. The same became, became mighty men, which were of all men of renown. Again, King James, he translates this word as renown, but in the oldest text, the Hebrew word is Hashem. means the name. And so effectively, what they're really saying, because it doesn't make sense unless you understand about the name of the Most High, how important it is. And I'm going to do a video dedicated to that because people... People walk around talking about, oh, it doesn't matter what we call him. You, you have not read these scriptures. His name. He tells Moses, I am going to send my angel. Listen to everything he says. Do what he tells you because my name is in him. You better know his name. And he says his name 7,000 times in those scriptures. And you ask your average Joe. Christian, what's the name of the Most High? Uh, God. No, it's not. You don't even know what G-O-D means. I can tell you what G-O-D means, but not in this video. The name of the Most High is Yahweh, right? So pronounced with as three syllables. That, that's, that middle syllable, the, what the Hebrew Vav, is almost silent. You just frame your mouth as if you're going to say it, but you don't really say it. So I wouldn't say Yahuwah or Yahawa. I would say Yah, rest, wah, right? Yah, frame my mouth to say it, but don't say it. So it's like Yahwah. So it's three syllables. It's not Yahwah. That's two syllables. It's Yah, rest, wah. Yahwah. Yahwah, right? So say it that way. But, you know, my thing is, if you have the word Yah in there, you got it. Yeah. Because you, what, what that is insinuating is eternality. Meaning he distinguishes himself because he is the eternal one. So if you got Yah in it, you're pretty good. So I'm not, I'm not arguing that. So, and then the reason it's important to understand his name is because, if, here's the funny part. The father has the same name as the son. Think that through. But you wouldn't know that because what do you call the son? You call him Jesus. Well, that wrecks the whole thing. You can't understand anything further because you haven't recognized they have the same name. And there's a reason they have the same name. They have the same name because that name means eternal. That's telling you that the Messiah is one of the eternal mighty, mighty ones or Elohim. And so we got into that in the previous video. So you got to understand that there's Yahweh the Father, and then there's Yahweh Shah the Son. They have the same name, just the suffix Shah is added. And some people say Shua. I got no problem with that either. But, and I understand it. Also, some people say Yeshua. I'm not thrilled with that because you've taken the Yah out of it. But sometimes you read it and it looks like they kind of abbreviate Yah sometimes all the way to just a, the Yud sound, the Y or E. So you might say Yeshua, right? So I'm not even going to be that uh, picky about that, but I, I don't know about that one. Uh, I think you need to have the Yah in there because that's the key portion of the term, eternality. So... Um, Yahuwah and Yahuwah Sha, abbreviated to Yahusha, right? And so it's kind of spelled out that way. Anyway, that's, there's a lot going on there. Um, men of renowned, renowned is 
the Hebrew word Hashem, which the, means the name, and they're not talking about God's name or Yah, Yahweh's name, rather. What they're saying is they are getting a name for themselves. And then if you read later, Nimrod does the same thing. They wanted to build a tower to get a name, so they would get a name. That, that's, that's more important than you think. What they're saying is they, they don't want the name of the Most High. They want their own name. So when you're, what do we say today? He made a name for himself right? Well, essentially, ultimately, you're making yourself God. You're saying, I got a name for myself. I don't need his name. That's kind of what the, where this is going. So these are men of renown, meaning they got a name for themselves. Fast forward to Babylon, that's Nimrod's trying to do the same thing. And there's speculation that Nimrod was also a Rephaim. I, I don't know if that part is true, but it could be. It, it sounds logical. But then that same principle is holding. We here in Babylon are building this tower to make a name for ourselves. To make, our, uh, make a name for ourselves, not use your name, Yahweh, Father Yahweh. We're going to make a name for ourselves because they understand the importance of the name. So this is their version of it, the name, right? So this word renown is trans is actually translated from the Hebrew Hashem, the name. But these these Nephilim are not have nothing to do with the Most High. These Watchers are in rebellion against the Most High, so they're not like saying, "Hey, yeah, we want to worship," uh, you know, the name. And so you got people today worshiping Hashem, and I don't think they realize that goes straight back to Babylon. You don't want to be worshiping Hashem. You don't. Remember, the Most High tells you his name over 7,000 times. Why are you not saying it? You need to ask that question. It's just the same as the Sabbath day. People don't keep the Sabbath and they say, and they say oh, it was done away with. Who did away with it? I mean, so if you just see the rebellion in the nature of things, that the uh, Everything Yah says to do, we find a justification to not do it. And that's somehow good? I mean, really, that's literally insanity. We don't have to observe the Sabbath anymore. Really? Uh, where does, well, it turns out the Roman church made everybody, turned everybody from the uh, Hebrew God, or uh, Elohim, to the Roman pagan <laughs> worship. And one of the things they worshiped was the sun. So now everybody was made to, to worship on the ancient pagan day of worship, which we call today Sunday. So they changed it. And they'll tell you they changed it. That's the funny part. It's not in the Bible. So stop saying the Bible said, oh, it was done. Away. No, the, the, the Roman church will tell you that we are the vicar of Christ, and this is God's kingdom, and we get to change whatever we want because we stand in the place of Christ. So we did all these things. You can't make this up. Anyway, Genesis chapter 6, verse 23, And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. So no, the Nephilim did not survive the flood. And that's another thing, you keep seeing that on the, on the internet and stuff, like they're talking about mermaids and stuff. I'm like, come on, people. And so the devil is throwing as much, because this information is getting out there. It's, it's getting learned. So when once the devil cannot stop it, he infiltrates it. He infiltrates it and confuses it. He throws Babylon in there. Babel, Babel means confusion. Right, so it's kind of a, if you can't beat it, join it. And then when you join it, you take it over and destroy it. And that's what happens. So nothing is static. Everything is dynamic. What I mean by that, if you're in a church and you think your church is the, is, is the one true church, understand, look at the age of that church. How long has it been around? Think of it this way. It's a principle. Anything that starts out good 
if it starts out good and lots of things start out good, a lot of well-meaning, well-intentioned people, but as time goes on, the devil infiltrates it all the time, every time. There's nothing you can imagine that he, if it's good, that he doesn't go, hey, we got to infiltrate it and destroy, and destroy it. Everything. So if your church has been around a long time, I'm telling you, it's already destroyed. So you'll see some new understanding pop up and then a new group pops up. And usually the people who start these groups, um, I mean, it goes either way. It could be, you know, evil. <laughs> but also some very good things come out. And usually it comes out because people in these older organizations see the, the fallacies. They see, hey, this ain't right. And then, of course, they, they'll try to change it from within but those entities are too well established. You're not, you're not going to change. Let's face it. You're not going to change the Catholic Church. It, it, you're just not. It's been around too long, right? Uh, Protestantism. You're not going to really change that. So usually, people who start seeing things or, or get awakened to things, they usually leave or get kicked out, and they usually start something else. And of course, there's this whole process. The established groups will call them heretics. Right, so if you're Protestant, of course the Catholic Church was call, calling you a heretic, and if they caught you, they were burning you at the stake. Just because you're getting burned at the stake, don't mean you're wrong. <laughs> it probably actually means you're right. I mean, think about it. They crucified Christ. You know, wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. That means the majority of the people on this planet. Or out of their minds. That's what it really means. Uh, and if you're in the majority, you're probably out of your mind too. And, and I mean that. And I mean that very sincerely. You cannot read the scriptures and not understand that principle. Okay, Ezra says, for uh, this world was made for many, but the world to come made for few. What does that mean? It means like, hey, most people are not going to make it. <laughs> I mean, that's the bottom line. you got to understand if you're in a majority, you're probably just wrong. And if you don't view things that way, then you're just in the minority, uh, majority and you'll just be wrong. And, and you'll probably be claiming when you're standing before the most high, well, I didn't know. You didn't tell me. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that guy, that, you know, that guy, a crazy guy, <laughs> the one you didn't listen to, he was trying to tell you. He was my servant. He was trying to tell you. You just thought he was nuts. Why? Because you had an apostate mind. You had a, a reprobate mind. You just were blind and didn't want to see, and you refused the opportunities that were presented to you, and you refused to believe. That's what's going to happen. So, no, look at what everybody else is doing, and then do the opposite. <laughs> and that sounds crazy, but that's kind of what it is. So, anyway... So the Most High wipes out all, basically, everything living on the earth to get rid of the Nephilim because they were supplanting men as the dominant species on the planet, and he wasn't having that. You're, I created men, and men will rule this earth. Not these re rebel Nephilim from you rebel watcher angels. Not going to let it happen. So that tells me in the very end, it's going to kind of start happening again. That's why I tell you uh, these Nephilim are still around. That's why Paul says women should pray with their heads covered because of the angels. And that sounds crazy, right? I mean, you read that and you go, what is Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about that. Anyway, Psalm 22, verse 9, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, for there is none to help. Words to live by. The disembodied Nephilim. So Nephilim, when they were drowned, because they had uh, angel fathers, they had a certain level of, um, what's the word I want to use? I can't call them immortal because immortal kind of sounds like something that can't be killed, but they inherently just live. So 
if you take away their bodies, well, they don't go to the places that Father Yah has prepared for his creation. He doesn't accept them, and so they have nowhere to go. So as in disembodied spirits, and the spirit in man is different than angel spirit, and I, I need to do a video on that because everybody thinks that human beings have immortal souls. No, we don't. The book of Timothy will tell you only God is immortal. In fact, what he's doing through this whole process is offering us immortality. That's the actual promise. It's not some land. I know they call it the promised land, but it's uh, sim symbology, right? It's metaphoric. The promised land represents what? Eternal life. That's the real promise. The Jordan River, remember the word Hebrew means to cross over. We're crossing from death into life, right? So when they crossed over the Jordan into the promises, promise of eternal life. In that instance, it was a foreshadowing. So the promise was a land, but the ultimate pol uh, promise is eternal life. And I want you to do the math here. Only the Elohim have eternal life. So if the Elohim are offering you eternal life, let's do the math. What are they actually offering you? Only Elohim have eternal life, and they're offering human beings eternal life. So what do you become? Let's do the math. Come on. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> I want to leave you with that part there. But uh, we're going to continue on here. And you're going to discover the incredible human potential. I don't think people get it. The thing that we're being offered and turning down, throwing it away. It's like insane. So anyway, I'm going to go to Jubilees because now we're going to talk about the disembodied Nephilim. What happened to these creatures after their bodies were destroyed? Well, their spirits, unlike the human spirit, is sentient. What I mean by that is the human brain is the, is the driving force for our spirit. It's, it's a material thing. Now, I know a lot of people argue that point, uh, but like I said, I'm going to do a video on that. But um, in a sense, I view the human spirit, and this may sound bad, but hear me out. It's more of a dumb spirit. It, it doesn't have just an inherent uh, um, animation. I don't know if that's a good term. Angels do. They were created as spirits. And so their descendants are also animated spirits, meaning their, once their bodies go, their spirits still remain. They're still animated. They still can do things, right? A human spirit, if it's not what I call fertilized by the Holy Spirit, to where, and they talk about it, Paul talks about it a lot, begotten or conceived by the Holy Spirit. He's using all these gestation and partration terms, which should t hint to you what's going on here. What's the plan? If you receive not the Holy Spirit, then you, your spirit is unfertilized. And what happens to an unfertilized egg? Every 28 days, it gets flushed. But if it does get fertilized, a new life is being created. So think that through. And we're going to continue to Jubilees chapter 10, verse 4. So Noah and his sons escaped the flood, but there's a problem. You got these disembodied Nephilim. Which turns out, those are now called demons. They're demons. That's where demons come from. They're not angels. They're disembodied Nephilim. So, uh, verse 4, But do thou bless me and my sons, that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And thou knowest how thy watchers, you know, the fallen angels, the 200 fallen angels, and their cohorts, the fathers of these spirits, talking about the disembodied Nephilim, acted in my day. And as for these spirits which are living, imprison them and hold them fast in the place of condemnation and let them not bring destruction on the sons of men, on the sons of thy servant, my God, my Elohim. For these are malignant 
and created in order to destroy. That's their nature. That's what they do. It's not that they're not, they don't recognize what, <laughs> when you look at big corporations today, and they're spilling oil in the oceans, and they're strip mining, and they're chopping the tops off the mountains of the Appalachians. Uh, I mean, think how beautiful the Appalachian Mountains were. These mining companies are going in and saying, hey, why should we tunnel under the mountains? Let's just chop them down <laughs> until they're not there anymore. And I guess eventually the Appalachian mount, uh, Mountains will become a valley, <laughs> a long valley, you know, like a... a 10,000 mile long valley by the time they finish destroying that beautiful creation called the Appalachian Mountains just to get coal out of it. I mean, you do realize that's going on, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I even see it when they're around the cement plants. You look at the surrounding uh, foothills. They have been reduced and flattened down to almost nothing because they're taking the... Uh, minerals out to make uh, concrete. So everything these big corporations are doing are destroying the planet. You know, the factories are putting toxic chemicals into the air, and yet they're telling you that is your, it's your fault. <laughs> I mean, really, just think that through. So, you know, and then you watch these billionaires flying around on their private jets spewing, you know, carbon emissions into the atmosphere and then they land at the destination and give a speech saying we all have to tighten our belts and these cows these cows have to go because their, their flatulence is destroying the you know creating the uh, greenhouse effect now if you took 10,000 cows through their lifetime they will not produce as much uh, methane or, or, excuse me, carbon emissions, as that one flight did. So understand this. There's just things going on that obviously don't make sense. And the people doing it are, don't care that it doesn't make sense. They just know that Joe Blow is buying it. And uh, you, guys got, you guys got hell on your hands. It's coming. It is coming. It is here. You know, between that and transhumanism and, and um, what is it, what I call, you know, fake meat products and also, just look. And the genetic work, we have pretty much mastered the genome, you know, and if you look at some of the reports, and they could be hoaxes, but it looks like they know how to splice things and create hybrid things and you know, maybe it's a hoax. Who knows? Maybe it's just uh, tin hat stuff. But I tend to think it's pretty logical that if we can make, um, how should I say this? I do know we know a good deal about genetics. Let's, let's put it that way. And if we know as much as I think we know about genetics, I'm pretty sure it's quite possible to create hybrid species and all that stuff. Whether it's happening or not, you know, there are laws passed in certain countries concerning cloning and things like that. And then there are other countries that refuse to sign those agreements. So what happens? Uh, yep, we, we outlawed it in our country. But we're just going to move our laboratories to the countries that didn't outlaw it. So that's kind of what's going on. You, you can see it. Anyway, it's all nuts. So anyway, here at Jubilee's Chapter 10, um, Noah is praying to to the Elohim to say, hey, yep, you drown these Nephilim. Their physical bodies are destroyed. However, their spirits endure. And their spirits are dangerous enough to still wreck everything you're planning to do. You need to help us out. If you want us to replenish this earth, you got to get rid of these guys. And so, you know, the Most High hears them. Um, but there's still a plan. You got you to ask yourself, why does the Most High allow certain things? Well, iron sharpens iron. And if man did not have a, uh, uh, an equal and opposite or something to overcome, his spirit would not develop. And so that's actually the power of man is that he has to overcome. 
And it's, it's, it's kind of wild because if you overcome, you've essentially defeated the Satans, which is kind of a, a rite of passage in a way, it meaning you have literally proven to be more powerful. And that sounds wild since you're just in the flesh. But the key to overcoming the Satans is faith and love. You know, those things that are fruits of the Spirit. Be instant in prayer. And so we're going to go into what happens, you know, when you pray, how you can overcome anything, everything. You have the armor if you choose to put it on. And not saying your life's going to be easy because if you're, if you're out there in battle, yep, you're getting hacked up. And even if you win, you're probably, you know, oftentimes in the Psalms it talks about David, you know, after the battle, they looked at David and thought he was dying. Because it wasn't David going into battle and not getting hacked up and stabbed up and all that stuff. He, no, he was getting hurt. I mean, this was a hand-to-hand combat. There's, there's no duck and bullet stuff. I'll just stay in my foxhole. No, you were going at it. You were throwing fists. You were hurling stones. You had bats, not baseball bats. No, no Louisville, Louisville sluggers in this, but you had clubs, right? Slings, uh, Balearic sling is what they call it today. Um, and of course, swords, bronze swords until it became iron swords, you know, by the time of the Roman Empire. But it's now in the Iron Age, right? So, anyway, um, yeah. And so they would look at David and he, he would say in the Psalms, My sore ran in the night. He could feel his spirit leaving him. He's dying. But then he gets some good sleep, sleeps for a couple of days, and he recovers, and the wounds heal, and he's back. Because the Most High wasn't finished with David, so he sent his ministering angels, and they healed him up, and he got back on his feet and kept going. And that's a key point, too. I want you to think, remember that little part there. So anyway, uh, Jubilee chapter 10, verse 49. So remember, uh, Noah prayed, hey, Father Yah, can you get rid of these demons? These disembodied Nephilim, they're ruining everything. And here's the response. And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him. Meaning, we're going to allow 10% of them to stay. And let the nine parts, 90% of them, descend into the place of condemnation. Well, that's where the fallen watchers are. They're in jail. So he's going to take 90% of these disembodied Nephilim and throw them in jail. And we go over that in the other videos, too. So, again, watch the Sons of God uh, Descend video. Um, and, uh, you know, that whole playlist, um, you'll, you'll get a lot out of it. And uh, we'll continue here. So, basically, that's where demons come from. And so now you know what you're dealing with. And so by the time Messiah comes along, you understand what he is dealing with. When he's casting out a demon, he's casting out a disembodied Nephilim, this ancient creature that has no form anymore. Psalms 22, verse 12. Many bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Again, this is crucifixion language. It's depicting the Messiah on the cross, what he was going through. But David is saying it, so David is seeing it. Amazing. So King David the Exorcist. Wow. I've read uh, the hands of a king or hands of a healer. So the king was granted certain gifts certain powers. I don't think we realize that. So David was anointed with a certain power. And so we read in First Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. But the spirit of Yahuwah departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahuwah troubled him. So, hmm, evil spirits come from Yahuwah. The Most High is the one that sends you know, it's funny. People say, you know, like there's God and the devil. 
and good things all come from God, and bad things all come from the devil. But if you read the Old Testament, all things come from Yahweh. Nothing happens that he doesn't either initiate or allow. So he has the, the evil angels that attacked uh, the firstborn of, of Egypt. So wait a minute, Yahweh has evil angels? He has control of everything. And these evil angels, they only know destruction. And they're chained up, right? So, or, or inhibited. And sometimes he'll remove his hand and let them do what they do. And so the firstborn of Egypt was smitten, right? And so here it says, uh, because of uh, Saul's rebellion, um, he's chosen another to be king of Israel. And so the spirit of Yahweh, the Holy Spirit, left Saul. And then not only that, he took away protection. That hedge he put around uh, the king of Israel, in this case, he removed it and allowed the evil spirits to come. And uh, Saul had no power to deal with them. So what does he do? It says it troubled him. Another word rendering could be it terrified him. He's been kept in a perpetual state of terror. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 15, And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from the Elohim troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is cunning, is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from, from Yah is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. So it was even understood back then that music has the ability to alter, to affect the spirit world. And we should think that through. We should, we should internalize that one. Music is a force. It's a power that affects the spirit world. And vice versa. So you keep that in mind as you're listening to these crazy songs that are on the radio. You know, anywhere from heavy metal to rap, I mean, there's some demonic stuff being pushed into the atmosphere. And that's why Paul said uh, um, he's the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world. That tells you what this world is, right? If Satan is the god of this world, be in it but not of it. Come out of her. Come out of Babylon. That's what that means. So his servants are telling him, you got to find a musician, right? And because uh, that, that should soothe you, right? And so they go out looking for this uh, guy who can play for the king, right? So 1 Samuel 16, verse 17, And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing and, mighty, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and, a pr and prudent in matters, and a comely person. He's, he's good looking. <laughs> so, you, you know, you don't want some, you know, <laughs> if you're the king, everybody around you got to look good because I'm the king. So everything better be, be in place, right? And he's a comely person, and, the, and Yahuwah is with him. Wherefore, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. So David's back with the sheep, but now he's got a new job. So remember, he was just anointed a king of Israel by Samuel. And so that's part of faith, right? Uh, he's anointed king of Israel. So at that moment, David was king of Israel. Even though there's a king sitting on the throne with an army and everybody acknowledging him to be king and nobody's acknowledging David to be king except his father and, uh, you know, seven brothers and Samuel. And even his father and his seven brothers are like, no way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But at that moment, he was already king of Israel. It just hadn't manifest yet. So understand that principle too. Once, that, once it goes forth from the Most High, it's a done deal. You are already that thing. 
You just have to kind of stand back and see how it's brought about. So anyway, um, and Saul sent unto Jesse, uh, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and, and was well. And the evil spirit departed from him. So David had a gift. And everybody in Israel understood it. He has the ability to manipulate these demonic forces. They essentially will listen to him. And if you look at the word Psalms, some people say that, you know, it can mean songs, it can mean poetry, it can mean, but it can also mean spell. Like, uh, almost like an incantation. I, that, I know that sounds bad, but hear me out. Um, he, and even Solomon, you know, there's that whole thing about the, uh, what do they call it, that book about Solomon? You know, I forgot the name of it. Anyway, where it's, you know, now the legitimacy of that book, you know, uh, who knows. But they claim that Solomon had the ability to enslave demons. And, you know, that because of the timing, I think the uh, you know, that book on Solomon was written at a, between the years 100 and 500 A.D., you know, way past after Solomon. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't some truth in there, right? And I say that because his father, David, had this power. And it probably does transfer to Solomon. In fact, the, the line that leads to Christ, they may have all had that power. Um, or, or maybe it's just individual, who knows. But what the Messiah was showing by casting out demons was that he had the same abilities as his forefather David. So this was kind of a sign to the children, to the Hebrews, that I am the descendant of David. Not only physically, but I have that same gift. I am also able to cast out evil spirits. And so this was a big thing. So that's something, yeah, Messiah should be able to do what his forefather David did, you know. And so you see that principle being played out in the uh, casting out of demons. So it's not some arbitrary random thing. It's a marker. It's a sign of his kingship. It's a sign of his descendancy. It's a sign that he is Messiah, Amashiach. Psalms 22, verse 15, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. More crucifixion language. He's suffering on the cross. The son of David, suffering on the cross until he rise again. Christ, the giant slayer. All right, now we're bringing this home. So remember, Christ means anointed or Messiah, Hamashiach. And he is of the line of King David. So he's casting out devils to show he has power over devils, which was attributed to both King David and King Solomon. And not just the, uh, he's not just saying, hey, I'm praying necessarily for just protection, but I have power over them, right? So let's look at the book of Mark because um, they start addressing the demonic forces here, right? Mark 1, chapter 1, verse 23. And there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, a demon, and disembodied Nephilim. Remember, Nephilim are trying to find a home. They're used to having a body, so they, since they don't have bodies, they seek to inhabit other human beings, and they seek to control that body and imprison your spirit as they take control of your body. What we call that is, in layman's term, demon possession, right? And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? 
I, kn- I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold your peace and come out of him. Commands him, right? Commands him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, sent that man into convulsions and threw him to the ground and cried with a loud voice and he came out of him. Just like David's playing caused the evil spirit to come out of King Saul. Okay, you have a marker there. This man might be legitimate. And then we come to, uh, he's describing how the the demonic world works. And much like what I just said, so let's read what it says here. Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Notice in this passage, they bring up Solomon. Why bring up Solomon in this passage? So there's legitimacy. You'll, You'll see what I'm talking about. Solomon's abilities were maybe even greater than David's abilities. Let's continue. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through the dry places seeking rest and findeth none. So the dry places is just the, you know, he's disembodied, he's walking around with a no sustenance. And, and remember, sustenance is more than food. It's, uh, he can't experience anything anymore. He's out of his body, he can't feel. Remember I said angels, when they, when they form themselves into human beings, uh, human flesh, they now become essentially subject to that flesh, meaning they start experiencing feelings, lust, you know, hunger, all these things, but they also experience pleasures, right? So it could be like a drug to them. So these, uh, now the Nephilim had it kind of reversed. They were born into flesh, right? So they knew from day one the pleasures of the flesh and also the pain of the flesh. But when they're cast out, now they long for, for their flesh again. They're like, wow, we're out here in the middle of nowhere. And they see all these little houses and then they, they walk up to these houses. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So let's continue here. So when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through the dry places seeking rest and findeth none. That's what I mean. But he looks at each one of us like a little house that he wants to live in. So some doors are locked. Some doors are wide open. Some doors, the front door is locked. But the back door is wide open. Take that for what it's worth. Let's continue. Matthew chapter 12, verse 44. Then he said, I will return into my house from whence I came. From whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty swept and garnished. So the demon left this person, and if that person uh, leaves his doors wide open again, that same demon that just left him, you know, he comes back, and he finds that the house has been cleaned up. And, and I know that sounds wild. See, the house he left, he had wrecked, and then it was un- uninhabitable, and he was kicked out by the landlord. <laughs> so... But then he's wandering around with no place to live. He's homeless. And he sees that house he used to live in. And the, ho- and the, and the owner had fixed it up and cleaned it up. And it looks really good. It looks better than before. Right? But the doors are all wide open. The windows are open, everything. And now he turns into a squatter. Yeah. That's what demon possession is. It's this thing squatting, right? So they're attracted to, to it. So... If you're a believer and you clean up your act and say those demons that were living in you or hanging out on your porch, they got kicked out, right? And now they see how much work has been done and how nice it looks and how clean it is. Even if you're a filthy animal, you still prefer a nice clean house. Now, if you're a filthy animal, you'll turn that nice clean house into a filth, (laughs) but, but... it doesn't start out that way. You go, wow, that looks really nice. I want to go back in there. And so now you know what you're up against, right? 
Uh, then goeth forth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell, dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So get that right. So it's weird that, say you're, uh, you know, and if you're a Christian, you, you get where I'm coming from. You know, you have those moments. You, you start falling falling back into old old sins or whatever. And then the Holy Spirit hits you, and then you come up out of it, and you're starting to live righteously. So what happens is it's kind of weird. Like, the stronger you get, the greater the temptation will get. And, and you'll see that in the temptations of Christ. If you're, if you're like, uh, if you're easy, you know, the devil will just offer you a Snickers bar, <laughs> right? But if you're really strong and somebody that could, if he could sway you to his cause, would be a great asset, he's going to offer you a lot more than a Snickers bar, right? And so you, you can see, he, once he recognized the power of Christ, Mashiach, he said, this guy is no joke. He says, I got to offer him everything. I mean, that's how he recognized the power. He said, I can't offer this guy a Snickers bar. I can't offer him gold. I can't offer him women. This guy is too powerful. I got to offer him the whole nine yards, all the kingdoms of the earth. That's, he knew how powerful this human was. He said, I've never seen one like this one. So, but we're going to get into that more. What him when when the when the Christ goes up on the mountain and he's tempted by the devil for forty days and forty nights? That's just not useless banter. There are things going on there. And remember, the Satans don't know the plan, right? They don't, but they know something's up. Something's afoot, and we got to find out what's going on. So I'm going to test this guy. Let's first of all see how strong he is. Hmm. Let's see what the, our limits are against this guy. Can we kill him? Well, let's see. But before we go into that, let me talk about Psalms 91 because it all goes back to this psalm. So Psalm 91 is in the, in the scriptures in the, in the 66 books of the Bible, right? But apparently, at, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are about four other psalms that are uh, tied to this psalm, right? And uh, it, this psalm is called the Psalm of David, right? But these other four psalms are directly related to exorcisms, to the removal of unclean spirits. And so there's more to it than meets the eye. For some reason, these other psalms aren't, weren't incorporated because they directly start talking about exorcism. So I don't know if uh, after these psalms are found, if they're hidden and only certain priesthoods, I won't say who they are, they keep them hidden there. Now, can't let people know about this. Only we shall know how to cast out demons, right? <laughs> so there's a lot going on. This stuff you don't know about, this stuff that's being hidden from you. Um, but just understand, Psalm 91 was part of that group. They were all in the same jar, <laughs> if you will. The exorcism jar, if you want to call it, at the uh, Dead Sea, right? At Qumran, right? Anyway, let's read this thing. Um, and at first, it doesn't sound like an exorcism, you know, writing but it actually is once you understand the actual Hebrew words you need to understand. I'm not saying you need to be fluent in Hebrew, but look stuff up sometimes randomly, right? Especially if you don't understand something. So let's read Psalm 91, uh, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of, of the Lord, Yahweh, he is my refuge and my fortress. My Elohim, my God, my mighty one, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. And then you start, you know, okay, that sounds pretty straightforward. Okay, he'll, he'll protect you from being sick and being trapped in bad situations. 
But when you see that word pestilence, when you go to the Hebrew word, Deber, turns out this correlates to a Canaanite god. And understand, yes, there are other gods or other Elohim. We talked about that in the Sons of God Descend, right? So watch that video. I'm telling you. And also read that book, uh, God Through the Eyes of the Hebrews, because I go into a lot of stuff about the the nature of God or the Elohim. Anyway, the Hebrew word is Deber. Turns out this is a Canaanite God or a demon because what is a God? That could be a, a disembodied Nephilim, you know. Or a lot of the angels are fallen because they like being worshipped as gods. So they want to be like the Most High. Don't they even say that? They, it's not like a like an overthrow of Yahweh. They know they can't do that, but they kind of admire how he's living. We want to be like that. We want to be worshipped. And so they get the other nations, the Gentiles, to start worshipping them. And there's a lot of these angels, so there's a lot of these gods, technically. So you get this pantheon of gods, right? But what are they? Really fallen angels, right? Or fallen Elohim is what they are. Understand an angel Angel is just a job description. It means messenger. But Elohim means a powerful one, a mighty one, something greater than a man, above humans, right? So Psalm 91, verse 4, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be in thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror. Right? Look at the Hebrew word for terror, pahad. Now that's a Canaanite God. Hmm. It's a terror by night. So you don't have to worry about Pahad coming to get you at night. Do you get it? Um, nor for the arrow. That's another Canaanite God. That's the word Hes. A Canaanite God that flieth by day. So there's another demon God that attacks by day. There's one that attacks by night and one that attacks by day. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction, Hebrew word, Keteb, another Canaanite god that wasteth at noonday. There's one that comes at night, one that comes in the day, and one that comes at lunchtime. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? So he's calling out, there's more to this. He's calling out these Canaanite gods. Who, what are these Canaanite gods actually? Fallen angels or demons that are being worshipped as gods. Human beings have been deceived that these are gods. Well, they, they are Elohim. Not the disembodied Nephilim. They're kind of half Elohim, if you will. But they're worshiping these, these Elohim forces as if they were gods. And these Elohim and these demons, they love that. They can't get enough of it. They, you know, they want to be like the Most High. They want this adju ad adulation, you know, whatever, adoration. So they're getting it, and they're still getting it. You know what I'm saying? So, so understand that this psalm is actually talking to protection from the gods of the nations or the gods of the land at that time, right? And King David is setting a force field around himself and around Israel by saying these psalms. Or, like I said, maybe you don't like the way I said it, they're almost like, pushing out spells, but, you know, not demonic spells. They're, they're words of power from the Most High or words of prayer. Prayers, what is prayer? It's requests that you make to the Father. And he can grant you these things. So it's, you know, it's kind of the light side of, of you know, a spell would be considered something on the dark sides. Uh, a prayer would be considered something on the light side, right? So, um, just understand what's going on in the Psalms. A lot of it is about manipulation of the spirit world, calling on the Most High to clear a path. And so the Apostle Paul says, be instant in prayer. Yes, I have to catch myself. I'll get in a bad situation, and maybe I'll find myself getting angry. And you're not even thinking, you know, your brain is going, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to do this? Uh, how am I going to overcome this? It's at that moment. No, 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 no. Relax. Get a cup of coffee and pray. 
In fact, pray first and get a cup of coffee. So anyway, because thou has made, uh, because uh, because thou has made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. It's not going to say that no bad thing will happen to you, but they won't have the victory over you. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. It's a force field. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. So you can look at it this way. Really? Uh, this is also prophetic. He's letting Hamashiach know you have all these gifts. <laughs> you know, he's actually even prophesying that this, these are the gifts he will have as my descendant because I got these gifts. You know what I'm saying? And everywhere I go, even when I'm outnumbered. And don't think that King David and his general, uh, the captain of the host, uh, Joab, his cousin, uh, in case you didn't know that, Joab, the captain of the host, was David's cousin. They found themselves outnumbered, outmanned, outgunned in hopeless situations. I mean, because they're going against the nations, and the nations are more numerous than they are. That's the miracle in everything that David accomplished. Because it wasn't David. It was his faith in the Most High being able to deliver him out of these hard situations. And here he is praying because he knows the, the dark forces that are leading the armies of his enemies, these demonic forces. He sees them. And so he sends up this prayer to the Most High, deliver me out of their hands. But Hamashiach is going to quote this very passage. In fact, the devil himself is going to quote this passage. And of course, of all the things the devil could do or say, why does he quote this passage? Because this is one of the passages of power, of the power that the Messiah would have, the power King, D King David had, King Solomon had. And he's also fishing for information. My, most people think, yeah, the devil can read your mind. The devil can't read your mind, but he can re read your actions. That's a game. So believers need to understand the game. Yah can, understand, can read your mind. He can read everybody's mind all at once. He knows what's going on. Ashatan cannot read your mind. So how does he know what you're thinking? How does he know what your weaknesses are? He'll put things in front of you and see how you react to it. And if, if it causes you to stumble, he goes, okay, I know, I know how this guy, I know how to get to him. Right? Because he sees you stumbling. Or you just offer things up. You just start talking. That's why the Bible says, you know, bridle your tongue because uh, what you say out your mouth can have a huge effect on what goes on around you. So be careful. So here, um, Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, Psalm 91, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So, and then of course, after that, he kind of blows him off and says, uh, get, get out of here, devil. I got stuff to do. So the devil is fishing for information because they don't know the whole plan. And you know they don't know the whole plan because what do they do to Jesus? Or Yahusha, right? The Messiah. What do they do to him? They kill him. Well, turns out that was the worst possible thing they could have done to him. So let's see. If, if Yahushua, the Messiah, had jumped off the pinnacle of the temple and the angels bore him up and so he floated down to earth, what would that have told the devil? Well, yeah, we can't kill this guy. He got, he got backup. And there's something going on here, but we know we can't kill him. And, and the Messiah didn't want them to think they couldn't kill him because that's the plan. They have to believe they can kill him. And he has to 
distress them enough to where they go, the only thing we can do is kill this guy. We got to get rid of him. And then, because he didn't jump off the, the temple uh, spire, he, he obviously is killable. He, he knew he couldn't jump, or this is the way they're taking it. He, he couldn't jump off that thing. Because if he jumped off and the angels floated him down, yep, he can't kill this guy. But we think we can kill this guy because he didn't do that. I mean, if you see where I'm going with it. So he's trying to feel him out. The Satans are trying to feel this human being out because they know there's something very special about him. So let's look at it. So uh, the confrontation here is uh, interesting in that um, as he's tempting uh, the Messiah, right, Hamashiach, he does a lot of little trivial things like, hey, you look kind of hungry. Why don't you turn this uh, rock into bread and have a bite? You know, of course, he, re report, he retorts, uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, right? So he's fighting back. He's like just saying, dude, is that the best you could do? <laughs> so then he comes back at him. Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 3. And then Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. And Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 8, you know. So he's fishing for information, and uh, some of these were so, it was almost like uh, Messiah was saying, bow down and worship you. Come on, dude, you can, you can do better than that, man. <laughs> That's not happening. So, you know, so finally he has to hit him with, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world, right? And that doesn't work. And that always works. I mean, literally, always. It always works. That's the, that's the ace in the hole. And then when he said, get hence, get the heck out of here, devil. I must be about my father's business, basically. That, what, did that, what did that tell Satan? And that told him, uh, this guy's going to make us look bad because apparently we can't tempt him. That's never happened before. I mean, we could tempt him. But I just offered him everything. And he said, no. Well, you can't offer more than everything. So now they huddle up and got to figure out what they're going to do. And so oftentimes uh, in the Old Testament, you'll see uh, them talking about the uh, Yah's servant. And oftentimes it means Israel. But in certain passages, it's very specific. And uh, this servant in, uh, in places has to accomplish certain things. Certain things that the nation of Israel did not accomplish. I mean, they, they get to the promised land and they don't drive all the inhabitants out. So the inhabitants become a thorn in their side and it's perpetual war. And then, you know, they, they follow after, uh, the nations follow after the era of Balaam. If they can't beat them militarily, eh, they send their cutesy little daughters over and the Israelite men end up uh, falling in love, and then they get mentally, King Solomon got mentally twisted up, spiritually twisted up by beautiful women, right? So that happens too. That's one of Satan's most powerful weapons is a beautiful woman, right? So Solomon fell to that one. And so the nation of Israel is torn apart, so they fell. And then the, the northern kingdom is taken captive. They fell, and the southern kingdom is taken captive. They fell. But uh, there's the representative of Israel, what I call the servant, the individual Israel. And he passes all the tests. He passes every one of these temptations that the nation fell to. This one guy actually passes all these tests. So now the devils know they're up against it. And their first instinct is we can't beat them. He won't join us. We got to kill him. And that's the whole point. And the Messiah set them up. Because they have to kill him. If they don't kill him, human beings will be yet in their sins, doomed to die, the second death, right? But if they kill him, and he rises again, of course, he becomes the propitiation for our sins. 
the true sacrifice that not on, not only covers sins but takes sins away. So the Satans actually trap themselves. They actually unwittingly, because they're so evil and wicked, fall into their own traps. And we should pray that. Let all those who set traps for us, let them fall into their own traps. Psalm 22, verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear Yahuwah, praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob, Glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Yes, he did. Yes, indeed, he heard. And he hears us today. Just humble yourselves, bow yourselves, pray, repent, and the Most High will hear you from his throne. So anyway... I think I'm going to end it on that note, of course. As usual, this went a little longer than I had planned. But just know this, I love you all so much. Thank you so much for continually supporting my content. If you did enjoy this video, hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe and turn on the notification bell. And share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they'd find it interesting as well. And I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. And I thank you all for bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated with certain events around the world. And I very much appreciate you all, and shout out to the channel members. And may everybody have a beautiful and blessed day who's in the body of Messiah, Yahusha, Hamashiach, and I'll see you all in the next video. Shalom, shalom family, shalom.